Welcome to Reflecting Light. And now, here's your host, Mandy Green. Hello, friends. Welcome to Reflecting Light. It's wonderful to be back with you today. For this week's podcast, I had something brought to my attention by my beautiful neighbor, Katie, who actually had just lost her dad a few months ago and posted this wonderful TED Talk. And it's this beautiful message about reframing and celebrating what's right in the world. And that is our message for today. So to start out with, I'll take a quote from his presentation. I'll also include a link to it in the show notes. And I really encourage you to watch this with the people you love, particularly in the dark, long December of 2021, Jan, Feb, March, five years in three months, whatever, however you want to look at it. Winter is not the apex of my being. I know for some people it is, and I congratulate them on it. I think that's awesome. However, I tend to identify with a Gemma Corral comic that has a woman with her dog. And in the comic, she says, I apologize for everything I said when it was winter. (laughs) That is me. I am not a person who loves the cold. It's important that whatever it is, whether it's winter or illness or relationships or job situations, that we can apply the beautiful truth spoken by this man. He really reflects light in the most positive, illuminating way. So let's visit the talk. He originally got this job for National Geographic. Now, if you're around my age or older, you understand what an icon the National Geographic is in photography. So according to this photographer, DeWitt, he said, the Geographic has an extraordinary vision, so simple yet so profound. What they charged me with every time they sent me out was to celebrate what was right in the world rather than wallowing in what was wrong with it. When I first began at the Geographic, I had no idea how powerful that vision would be, how it would change my life. But our vision controls our perception, and our perception becomes our reality. From the highest rainbows to rivers drenched in sunlight, to waterfalls and rainbows, everywhere I looked, there would be amazing beauty for me to photograph. And you know, in the geographic's view, man was not something separate from this. Man was just as magical as anything else on the planet. And the more I just went out and celebrated the best in humanity, the more I could see it. I could see that light, that light that shines not on us, but from within us. From within us when we have the courage to let it out. It's a beautiful sentiment. And it shows that this can become a way of thinking and that our perception really can influence our reality. Brene Brown said, vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not weakness. It's the greatest measure of courage. It does take courage to stand up in your environment in this time and place and look for beauty. See ways to reflect light. See ways that you can reframe something to see it in a more generous, beautiful way. He goes on to say, the more I shot for the geographic, the more I found this strange conflict growing up between the worldview of the geographic and the worldview that I'd been raised in since I was a kid. You all know it, the law of the jungle, eat or be eaten. My win is your loss. Second place is the first loser. That is a very depressing way to look at life. Far too many of us do see the world in that light, a world based on fear and scarcity and competition. But that's not what nature was showing me. Nature was showing me incredible beauty and possibility. Nature said, I'll fill it up with beauty and possibility beyond your wildest imaginings, right down to my tiniest seed. And there's a particular picture 
he shows in his presentation of a puffball, like a dandelion. And he made the most exquisite photograph of it simply because he had the eyes to see. He had the ability to get down, to try and see the beauty in that situation. He continues on by saying, that was just a much more elegant philosophy and a much more compassionate way of looking at the universe. And at some point, I just decided to embrace it. I just decided that if I had a choice between a world based on scarcity and fear and one based on possibility, then man, I was choosing possibility. Such a great way to look at life. Sir Winston Churchill said, fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. Is it possible that in all of this, you can choose to react to situations or you can decide how you will react to situations. That's one of the points for today. The other point that he goes to, and I think it's really valid and beautiful, and I actually just recorded a podcast with Mindy Brown about her beautiful book about Eve, and we talk about her research. And man, when I get that edited, we'll get it out there. But she had this beautiful point of view. And we talked about how there's so many different points of view. And in this podcast, sometimes we'll zero in on a particular point of view. Sometimes we'll look at one particular subject through many points of view. And that's the beauty of life. And that's the beauty of study and searching is that there's so many answers to the same question. There's so many ways of looking at the same thing. And truth is a multifaceted diamond. It will glow. It will shine. It will illuminate based on whatever angle you want to shoot at it. I love what he saw in nature that reflected that same idea that there was more than one right answer. You never need feel like I've arrived. I've figured it all out. I've got the answer. There's lots of answers. There's lots of possibilities. There's lots of experiences. There's lots of different kinds of people. So I'll continue to quote him. Through that lens of celebration, I could see one of nature's most important lessons. There's more than one right answer. There's more than one right answer. There are a thousand ways to come at any challenge to find that extraordinary view. So many things begin to change when you come at the world from that perspective of more than one right answer. First of all, you never look for just one right answer. There's always more. But then as you begin to find more and more of them, you just get more and more comfortable with reframing obstacles into opportunities. He goes on to say how he was shooting this beautiful shoot and he walked up to this field in the mountains in Canada And all they had were dandelions. And he thought, there's nothing extraordinary here. Because, I mean, let's be honest, not all of us can frame things positively all the time. I have one particular situation, so difficult to frame even 20% of the time. So he walked out and he thought, there's nothing really spectacular here. I'll come back. Well, he got sidetracked. And by the time he came back, the field had turned into a bunch of puffballs. And then he was really discouraged thinking, oh, I, I want a dandelions. Now all I have is puffballs. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, that life had already given you lemons and then you came back and there wasn't even any lemonade. You had lemon rinds. Uh, it happens. And so this is her, his response to that. Puffballs, puffballs. Pretty soon I'm down on the ground with the puffballs. I'm rolling around with the puffballs. I'm on top of the puffballs. I'm underneath the puffballs. And all of a sudden, whoa, whoa, that extraordinary view. It had always seemed to be there when I had looked through that lens of celebration. Extraordinary image. And I'll place that as the title artwork for this podcast. I just want you to look at that beautiful puffball through his lens. But I can already hear the cynics grumbling, do it. You're such a Pollyanna. The world is in flames, war, terrorism, poverty, global warming, and you're shooting puffballs. Well, to the cynics, I say, 
change your lens. Celebrating what's right is not a perspective that denies the real pain and suffering that exists on this planet. Rather, it is a perspective that puts those problems into a larger, more balanced context. A context when we can see that there's far more right with the world than there is wrong with it. In my friend Mindy's book on page 121, she talks about something called desirable difficulties. And this is all in the context of Eve. She's done a lot of research about Eve and all of the traditions surrounding her that are incorrect and how we need to reframe how we look at her. But this has to do with mortality, just the thousand natural shocks that flushes air to, to quote Hamlet. And she said that Teddy Roosevelt, well, I'll just read you from her book. Teddy Roosevelt is one of American history's heroes who notoriously sought out and embraced hardship because of the unmatched opportunity it afforded for growth. While serving as United States president, he looked forward to spending weekends leading his young children, along with any friends, cabinet members, or dignitaries who might be visiting, on what he affectionately termed scrambles. This hiking game was usually played in a rock, in Rock Creek Park, a large wilderness area near the White House, but he could make it work most anywhere. President Roosevelt would choose an identifiable landmark on a distant ridge and then challenge everyone to join him to a point-to-point walk, not turning aside for anything. The only rule was simple. Proceed in a straight line until you reach the designated endpoint. Of course, that was easier said than done. When they met an obstacle in their path, players could go over, under, or through, but never around. Avoidance was against the rules, which meant the route might require scaling a boulder, digging under a felled tree, or swimming across a stream. The children loved the adventure, returning home quite muddy and tattered, but proud of themselves for not giving up and eager for the next family scramble. Social scientists would term the obstructions the children faced during the scrambles desirable difficulties. They found that learning that emerges through meaningful, challenging experiences is more durable than learning that comes easily. Could it be that all of the puffballs in our life are actually the lessons that will stick with us? And we can sit in that field of puffballs and worry about all the weeds and dandelions it's going to sow, or we can reframe how we look at it. To finish quoting DeWitt, when I put on that lens of celebration, when I really allow myself to see and connect with the beauty of the world, I feel like I'm a cup that's so full it's just about to overflow. I feel like I'm falling in love. The whole world is beautiful and you are so full and so fired up. And that doesn't surprise me because when we're in love, we're in touch with a source of incredible energy. We call it passion. Passion. What most of us wouldn't give to be connected to the energy of passion on a daily basis. Well, extraordinary visions do that. They release passion. So no matter how strange a situation that I walk into, the first thing I'm going to ask, what's here to celebrate? What am I falling in love with? I think that's so beautiful. I love travel for that very reason. I honestly feel like I'm falling in love. It's that same heady, beautiful, undeniable, heavenly feeling of love and passion And it must taste like this French pastry. It must look like a devotee of Christ kneeling at the unction stone or smell like the incense at the Holy Sepulchre or feel like a walk in the English countryside or any of these beautiful experiences that the world has to offer us. He concludes by saying, change your lens, change your life. I lecture all over the country to all different kinds of people. And you know what? They all hunger for this lens of celebration. They all want to try it on. We all have it. It's right there waiting to be picked up. Why don't we do it? 
Maybe it's because every day the internet and the media bombard us with all that's wrong with the world, and it's so easy to buy into it. It's so easy to stare into that darkness. But wouldn't you rather focus on the light rather than the dark? That's the change we have to make when we put on that lens of celebration. It reminds me that there's always a choice. It's a difference of focus. If you remember the story of Peter looking to the Lord when he walks on the water, we really frame that very poorly. I don't know of any other mortal that has been able to walk on water than Peter. And yet, what's the story? Peter fell. But you'll notice that when he's able to walk on water, when he's able to do the extraordinary, it's because his focus is on the Lord. It's not on the waves. It's not on the winds. It's not on the chaos surrounding him. It's the Lord. And when he takes his eyes off of him, that's when he begins to fear. Michelangelo once said, I saw an angel in the stone and I carved to set it free. Do we have an artist's eyes? Do we have an artist's soul and heart where we can look at the stone and do the work, do the hard carving or allow life or divinity to carve within our souls so that we can set those angels free? DeWitt concludes by saying, And you know, the beauty of that world, our world, shows us a wonderful example of how to live, of how to love, of a banquet laid, of a cup overflowing. And I know that if we let that beauty fill us up, that we too will overflow and it will come out in everything we do, in the ideals we hold, in the passion and compassion we feel in the love we are no longer afraid to express. That perspective, that lens will change your life as it has changed mine. Beautiful, beautiful advice. Albert Einstein said, one cannot but be in awe when contemplating the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. Never lose a holy curiosity. My friends, I'm going to try better to breathe life and love and passion and compassion into the frames that my days present me with. If it's winter or if it's puffballs or if it's covid It's my experience that when I don't lose a holy curiosity, that when I see the world with beauty and possibility and look at what's right, that more tends to be right. And it really is a matter of perspective. Light can be reflected as we fine tune the angle of that mirror. If you go back to the very first episode, I recorded a reflecting light, if we can just get that perfect trajectory of how we place our mirror to reflect that divine light and love in our lives, it will shine out the brighter. And that is my wish for you this week, my friends, love and light. Thank you for joining us. We hope this episode lit a spark inside of you. For show notes and other information, please visit our website at reflectinglight.org. If you feel this program illuminated your mind and heart, consider a contribution to fund further episodes. And thanks for listening.